Welcome to True C to B, the last of the eight shows comprising the series about microfossils. This one reviews a succession of radiolaria during post-Paleozoic times and offers comment about their importance to biostratigraphy and their contributions to studies of paleogeography, climatic zonation, and water temperature. Five of the 14 families of radiolaria in Permian Strata perished in a great die-off of all marine fauna at the end of the Paleozoic era. But this plot of the relative abundance and range of the radiolaria shows that the nine families surviving the extinction included representatives of three orders, Antactinaria, Sumularia, and Nosolaria. These mainly short-lived holdovers into the Triassic are numerically insignificant in relation to the great burst of new families in Triassic times. These charts of the three orders list the new genera representing what has been called the Triassic Explosion. Among them, Antactinarians are relatively numerous, with four new families in early Triassic Scythian strata, supplemented by eight more in middle and upper Triassic beds. But Antactinaria are relatively infrequent in all post-Triassic formations. The range charts of the orders of Triassic radiolaria list the new genera piecemeal, but this combined plot of all three makes clear what explosion means. In summary, among the 56 families of radiolaria recorded in Triassic strata, 47 are new. 25 of them appeared in early and middle Triassic times, and the rest during the later stages of the period. And this chart of the names and ranges of later new genera, 24 in the Jurassic, only seven in the Cretaceous, and 22 during the Cenozoic, reflect the new niches made available by die-offs most numerous at the end of Triassic times. When 20 genera and 120 species disappear, at the end of the Mesozoic era, 28 families crossed the boundary with only eight becoming extinct. Surviving Mesozoic genera constitute a major fraction of the 131 families known in 2001 and the 22 new genera that began to appear in late Paleogene time owe their differentiation to the formation of Arctic water masses during polar cooling. These slides picture a few of the many hundreds of species that appeared throughout the 160 million years of the Mesozoic era. Nasalarians were more numerous than Spumularians, with Antactinarians a poor third. But uh, Spumularians predominated during the 65 million years of the Cenozoic and also today. The advent during the Aptian stage of the other organism with siliceous tests, the diatoms, and their great expansion in numbers during the late Cretaceous and the Cenozoic is reflected in a lessening of the sturdiness and to some extent the size of the radiolarian skeleton, almost certainly because the newcomers consume a considerable percentage of the silica available for test construction. Radiolaria occupy all possible planktonic habitats in oceans and seas, but are most numerous just seaward of the continental slope where upwelling currents supply nutrients and minerals. Warm equatorial waters harbor the greatest density of population. Their accumulated tests 
form the radiolar and oozes shown in yellow on this chart. The main habitats are characterized by specific grouping based on the principal source of food. Most herbivores graze in the upper 200 meters of open ocean, where algae are numerous. The symbiotrophs dominate in warm shelf areas and tropical gyres, whereas the tritivores and bacteriovores flourish in the cooler high latitude. And groups of genera that occupy a specific range of depths are also discriminatory in the food they prefer. Group boundaries have been detected at depths of 50, 200, 400, 1,000, and 4,000 meters. Similar habitats are inferred from fossil assemblages, but loss or erosion of tests and their sieving during the slow descent in the water column, together with their possible displacement by currents, makes their interpretation less reliable. And during burial, taphonomic alterations can modify an appraisal. Nevertheless, fossil assemblages have served to determine paleolatitude and thus to track movement of land masses, paleogeography, to determine the roots of ancient currents and gyres, to recognize abrupt changes in water depth and temperature, and to define the boundaries of rock sequences. But fossil radiolaria serve mainly to set up a geochronology which can be correlated with the chronostratigraphic time scale owing to the juxtaposition of radiolarian charts and igneous strata containing radioactive minerals, the clocks of chronostratigraphy. And radiolaria in subsea cores have been keyed into the well-timed succession of magnetic reversals. These associations, coupled with the nearly worldwide ubiquity of some fossil radiolaria, causes radiolarian biostratigraphy to be among the more nearly precise of the geochronologies based on the occurrence of protists. Some relationships are shown on these charts, where the positions of radiolarian markers in the chronostratigraphic column are well established. The first, a repeat of the deep sea cord well, highlights a rather common phenomenon, basalt and an overlying radiolarian chart. The others are shorter intervals in which radiolaria were of great importance in setting up a biostratigraphic succession. Colonial radiolaria have not been mentioned, for they are not fossilized as such. The great mass of gelatinous connective matter and the interlaced rhizopods around the profusion of central capsules are dispersed after death, and in some genera, opaline tests are either isolated crystals or are absent. All colonial radiolaria are symbiotrophs that obtain part of their nourishment from their algal guest production of food, but none has been found to be completely symbiotrophic. Colonial radiolaria prey on tinnitus, copepods, appendicularia, mollusk larvae, and tinahydra medusae, jellyfish. This cursory sketch of post-Paleozoic radiolaria ends with a summary of the accomplishments of specialists. A campaign to locate, sample, and date radiolarites that began in the early 1980s continues today. Some 400 living species and their ancestors have helped biogeographic and paleo-oceanographic studies locate zones of upwelling, determine the existence, direction of flow, and temperature of paleocurrents, and the presence of regional water masses, both existing and ancient. More broadly, dating by radiolaria has revised understanding of Tethian and Circum Pacific mountain ranges and their associated ophiolites and suture zones that define the, the limits of tectonic plates. But the main work of specialists is to set up regional biochronologies of radiolaria for the whole of the Phanerozoic era and to correlate them to produce a chronostratigraphic succession of species usable in precise agreement with the scale of geochronologic time 
measured by the decay rate of isotopes. Come on, next. Snails, big and small.